Good morning on this beautiful day here in Colorado Springs. Welcome to the World Challenge Chapel. And everyone watching online or on YouTube, thank you so much for being with us. If you'll get your Bible out and turn with me once again to Matthew chapter 8, today we'll be concluding that chapter and we'll be dealing with verses 28 through 34. This message is titled, Demons Tremble at His Name. Demons Tremble at His Name. Matthew 8, 28 says, When he arrived at the other side in the region of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men coming from the tombs met him. They were so violent that no one could pass by that way. What do you want with us, son of God, they shouted. Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? Some distance from them, a large herd of pigs was feeding. And the demons begged Jesus, if you drive us out, send us into the herd of pigs. He said to them, go. So they came out and went into the pigs. And the whole herd rushed down a steep bank into a lake and died in the water. Those tending the pigs ran off, went into the town, and reported all of this, including what happened to the demon-possessed men. Then the, then the whole town went out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave their region. And brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. Lord, I am so grateful to be a servant of the Most High God. Lord, at a word from you, Lord, demons tremble. They tremble at your name. God, they run from your presence. Lord, I am thankful that you, that you are healing people to this day. Lord, that you are telling demons to be gone. Lord, that you are making crooked paths straight. God, that you are making all things new. Lord, I pray that we will see the power, Lord, in the presence and the word of God. Lord, I thank you so much for Jesus, not just casting out demons and healing people in far off lands, but God, I thank you that I am one of these. God, that you saved me from addiction. God, that you saved me from the penalty of my sin. God, that you made me new in heart, God, and that you are conforming me into the image of your son. Lord, I pray this would be true for many under the sound of my voice today. Lord, that people who are oppressed and possessed and tormented, God, that they would be drawn in to you, God, that they would put their faith in you and be free. God, for those of us in Christ, Lord, let us be heralds of this message. Lord, let us also guard ourselves against the works of the enemy. Lord, the works that are meant to make us stumble, that are, that are meant to let us be, be, be caught up in besetting sin. Lord, let our eyes be open to the truth as we cling to Christ and him alone. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, by this point in chapter 8 of Matthew, we are waist deep in powerful displays of Jesus authenticating his claim to be the long-awaited Messiah and his claim to be the very Son of God. Jesus displays his divinity as he shows his supernatural power over sickness over disease, over the demonic, over the weather, and over every aspect of this natural world. All of the world is enslaved to the power of the kingdom of darkness at some level because we are all born into sin. We are all dead in sin and trespass. But we also see men and women who are enslaved to demonic forces in very clear and direct ways. And this is what we see here in this story, men who were demon-possessed, the Bible tells us. Their lives were completely possessed and completely controlled by demonic forces. Everyone in the world needs spiritual rebirth and freedom in Christ. All are dead in sin and in trespass. We all need to be resurrected in Christ's life we all need healing. We are all spiritually sick. And that's why Jesus said in Mark 2, 17, on hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have come not to call the righteous, 
but to call sinners. But some of our infirmities and our sicknesses and our addictions and spiritual death is more obvious and external. Listen, I, I see this in, in many ways in our world today. There are people that are dead in sin and trespass, but they're still living sort of functioning lives. But I see other people who are completely deceived and distorted and controlled by the devil, by demonic forces. This is what I equate transgenderism to. This is what homosexuality is. This is what addiction is. This is what mental health issues are today. This, these are things where our lives are controlled by, by dark forces. Now, I don't want you to think that I'm saying every mentally ill person is demon possessed. But what I am saying is that everything that is not in servitude and subjection to the authority of Christ will have demonic displays. And some of these will be very outwardly apparent. Some death on the outside is very apparent. This is what I dealt with as a pastor and, and previously to that a graduate of Teen Challenge. We see men whose lives are consumed by addiction, and it's demonic. Listen, we fast for the devil. We'll go without eating. We'll tithe and give offerings to the devil. We'll live our lives in complete subjection and complete control of this, this idea. Many of us live our whole lives trying to acquire one little bag, and we'll steal and kill and lie and cheat to do it. There are people whose lives are completely consumed by pornography. They, they can't wait to get down into that dark room in their house and, 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 and defile themselves. It's not just lust, it's consumed their lives. Listen, people who are running around and dressing like boys when they're actually girls or vice versa, and their whole life is consumed in this deception, and they're willing to raise a fist to God and, and deny His Word and deny His created order, and their whole life is revolving around this false identity. You can't tell me these things aren't demonic. I'm not opposed to counseling. I'm not opposed to medication. I'm not opposed to these things, but what we really need is a touch from God. And this is what we see in the story of these men who were demon-possessed. Their lives were completely controlled by demonic forces. We want a medical diagnosis for every disorder in the world. Many of us would rather cope with a distorted identity than to be made whole, to be made well. This is why sometimes when Jesus healed people, he asked them a question that almost seems silly. Do you want me to make you well? That seems like an odd question if you're sick or if you're paralyzed or if you're blind, but the truth is sometimes the answer is no. I'm comfortable here. I, I accept this identity. I prefer getting high than to living a regular life. Listen, because there's an illusion of control in these lies. There is a, an illusion. The devil will let you think that this is freedom and this is you controlling your life and living your truth. But what happens is on the other side of it, you realize that he's got you. He got the, the hook in deep. The fish hook's in deep. The hooks go many different ways and it's going to be a lot harder to get out than it was to go in. This is the lie of sin. And listen, this world is oppressed and possessed by demonic forces. I don't say this to give glory to the devil because he is a defeated foe. But the question is, do you want to be well? Sometimes it's because, not because we don't want help, it's because we have no hope left. Because we've tried everything else. We've tried to change our identity. We've tried to work our way out of the rut that we have worn into the ground. But what we find is we dig ourselves deeper and deeper and deeper. Sometimes we, we rest in our affliction. We rest in our possession. We rest in our addiction because of this. Because hope seems impossible. It seems so far away. The other reason is because of this, 
because we might actually know that Jesus could change us, but we don't want all the other things that come along with Jesus' help. We don't want to surrender our lives to God. We'd rather live in the delusion that we are the Lord of our own life, that we are in control of our own life. We'd rather die in addiction. We'd rather die in hopelessness than than give up the fake crown of our life when one day it will be taken from us because we are rebels and there's only one true king and Lord. Sometimes we prefer to live with our demons and somehow believe we are the Lord of our own life rather than being healed by the one who is truly Lord. Now, not all physical illness will be healed in this life. Many faithful servants of God will live their entire life without a physical healing. I said this in last week's sermon, but thousands of years leading up to Christ, people were sick. Jesus said the sick will always be among you. The poor will always be among you. They were here before he got here, and they were here after he ascended to heaven. That doesn't mean we don't pray for them. That that doesn't mean we don't believe in miracles. That doesn't mean that Jesus doesn't raise the dead and sometimes tell the, the, the lame person to rise and walk. But what we really have is freedom. This freedom is spiritual freedom. It's forgiveness of your sins and it's life in eternity with Jesus. No person who has their trust in God who has been made right in heart, listen, will ever be put to shame. There is no person, no matter what your physical element is in this life. And let me tell you something. I've seen God give freedom to many homosexuals, to many fornicators, to many drug addicts, to many people who are deceived by riches, many people who live for themselves, people uh, on every end of the spectrum, the poor, the rich, The American, the African, the gospel is for everyone and it's meant to bring freedom. But that freedom is giving us freedom from the the enslavement we have to sin. Verse 28, it says, When he arrived on the other side in the region of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men came out from the tombs and met him. They were so violent that no one could pass by that way. So after Jesus miraculously calms the storm, he arrives on the other side of the northeast shore of the Galilee. This area was generally referred to as the country of the Gadarenes, which is made up of a few small towns. Both Mark and Luke's account of this story Um, talk about this as well. But in their account, it's interesting, they only focus in on one demon-possessed man, where in Matthew's account, he talks about two. So in Matthew's account here, it says that Jesus encountered two demon-possessed men who were apparently living in this graveyard. It says they were so violent that people couldn't even pass through that way. The biblical concept of demon possession is real. And it's still real to this very day. Demonic control over one's mind causes people to do many things, often being violent or self-destructive or sadistic or masochistic, suicidal, murderous. I'm not saying that all people who deal with these things are demon-possessed, but I'm here to tell you there's only two kingdoms. It's spiritual oppression or spiritual possession, but it's something that comes from the evil one. I don't think that every person who's mentally ill is demon-possessed or every person who has some external problem, but there is some demonic influence in this. I believe in our modern world, we'd rather, even as Christians, give a medical diagnosis rather than a spiritual one. And this goes for many people who claim Christ, many people who say that their faith is in Christ as as Lord and as God. The Bible teaches that one demon, or even in this case, legions of demons, can possess and torment a person. Demon possession is real, but let me make one quick distinction here. There is a group of people who pretend like the supernatural is not real. 
that everything should be medically diagnosed, everything needs therapy, everything needs medication, there's no spiritual anything. But on the other side of the spectrum, there are, there are people today that think everything is the devil, sort of like a demon hunter crowd, these sort of people who give seminars on how to cast out demons and sell courses and write books about how you cast out demons. And they even, most of them preach that Christians can be possessed by demons. Now listen, this is nonsense. And we are not in the same camp as those people because those people aren't biblical. What does darkness have to do with light? But that doesn't mean that the demonic can't have influence and oppression and, 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 and have cause problems in your life if you're a believer. And if you're not a believer, you can be possessed, controlled, and completely ruined by the demonic. Jesus is Lord, and we say this, and we all, it's just a catchphrase to some people. Some churches we say, Jesus is Lord, but not over my anxiety, not over my diagnosis, not over my depression, not over my addiction. I need a different solution than Jesus and the power of the Spirit of God. I'm not against medicine. I'm not against counseling. But at the core of every problem, what we need is a touch from Jesus. We need to touch the hem of his garment. We need spiritual regeneration and sanctification. We need Jesus. And the reason why many people think they need Jesus and something else is because the Jesus they believe in is more of a myth or a good teacher or something that really has no interaction in their life today. That doesn't mean if, if I have uh, you know, heartburn, I don't take antacids. Or um, if I had cancer, that I wouldn't take medicine that they prescribed to me. Or if, uh, you know, in some cases, people are schizophrenic. I've known people who are, are schizophrenic and they are true believers in God. And if they take that medication, they don't fall into those same delusions. I'm not saying these things are wicked, but at the core of everything, Jesus has a place. And Jesus has power to do whatever he wills. And he works through people and he works through medicine and he works through counseling. But at the end of the day, many times we, we disassociate Jesus and the power of the Spirit of God from our everyday lives. The description of these men sound a lot like people I've dealt with who are afflicted with addictions of all kinds, people I've seen who are destroyed with mental health issues of all kinds, people who have many diagnoses we assign to them. Jesus encountered these demon-possessed men, and the demons in these men spoke directly to Jesus. Verse 29 says, What do you want with us, Son of God? They shouted. Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? Immediately the demons recognized and acknowledged him as the son of God. Mark's account gives us some more clarity regarding the conditions of these men. Mark 5, 1 through 7 says, They went across to the region of the Gadar uh, Gathering, excuse me. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. The man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. And he had often been chained by hand and foot. And he tore the chains apart and broke the irons from his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him and shouted at the top of his voice, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, don't torture me. I want you to see something here. This demon feared the power of Jesus so much that Mark's account says that he ran and bowed before him. He bowed down on his knees and begged Jesus not to torture him before the, the appointed time. Listen, demons tremble at the name of Jesus. 
in the presence of Jesus. They fear him because they understand something that many people who claim Christ today don't, that Jesus will judge the living and the dead and that all beings created in the history of existence will be judged by their creator. The demons actually understood more about Jesus' true identity at this time than the 12 disciples did. There is a very important lesson we can gain from this. Knowledge and profession of who Jesus is, is not enough. Some professed Christians expect to be in heaven and have surety about Jesus that he's going to save them in a way that's not connected to the Bible but they don't have surety about who Jesus actually is to the level that these demons do. It's not just knowing and declaring with your mouth by which salvation comes. It's through faith. It's through trust, which produces obedience, faith in the finished work of Christ on the cross and true regenerating faith. Hear me, true regenerating, regenerating faith will change the way you live your life. James, the half-brother of Jesus, addresses this in his epistle. James 2.14 says, What good is it, my brothers and my sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes or daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm, be well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs? What good is it? In the same way, faith by itself is dead if it's not accompanied with action. But some will say, you have faith. I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there's one God? Good. Even the demons believe and shudder. Even the demons believe and tremble. Even the demons, listen, they believe, they have no doubts about the fact that he is the son of God. They believe that his word is going to come to pass. Even the demons believe and tremble at his name and tremble at his words. There are many people today that call themselves Christians who don't fear the Lord. Who don't tremble at his name, who don't tremble at his word. And I'm convinced that these people can't know God in a saving way. If you claim the knowledge of God, but the fear of the Lord is not in you, then you don't really know who God is. If you don't have at least the same reverence for Jesus that the demons do, you'll probably better examine yourself. Isaiah 66, 2 says, Has not my hand created all these things, and they all came into being, declares the Lord? These are the ones on who I will look upon with favor. Those who are humble and contrite in spirit and tremble at my word. 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Paul says, Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fell the test. Examine yourselves. Do you have the same fear and reverence of the Lord that demons do? I understand that they fear the the judgment, the coming judgment that's going to be heaped up upon them, and we are going to be saved into eternal life. But the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. To realize that you need to be saved by God, you must first see who he is and tremble and fear at his righteous wrath that is being stored up for you and for me. It's that that drives us to repentance. And then we see the goodness and the love and the mercy of God as he pours out compassion on us because Christ poured out his blood for us. Let's get back to Matthew 8. In verse 30, it says, Some distance from them a large herd of pigs was feeding. The demons begged Jesus, If you drive us out, send us into the herd of pigs. One powerful truth we can glean from the demons' statement is that they knew they were completely at the mercy of Jesus. 
They knew that Jesus had ultimate power over them and everything else. Over the course of chapter 8, we see Jesus' supernatural and divine power over the physical realm and over the spiritual realm. It's not clear why the demons asked to be sent into this herd of pigs, since the text doesn't explicitly tell us. But some commentators suggest that maybe it's because the demons knew that Jews had nothing to do with pigs and they reviled them as unclean. So Jesus might not have minded them tormenting these pigs. But this is just a speculation. Upon this request, verse 32 says, Jesus said to them, go. So they came out and went into the pigs. And the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. Listen, demons are fallen angels. And they are extremely powerful beings. Even after being commissioned by Jesus to cast out demons, the apostles had trouble casting out certain demons. We see this in Matthew 17 when they could not drive the demon out of a child. And Jesus had to do it instead. Matthew 17, 19 and 20 says, Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked them. He said, Why could we not drive it out? And he replied, Because you have so little faith. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as that of a mustard seed, you'll be able to say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. But at a word from Jesus, this demon left this little boy. Didn't take pleading, dancing, chanting. Jesus said, be gone, and it was because Jesus is God. In the text we are studying today, we know from Mark's account that there were literally thousands of demons in these possessed men. Jesus is not dealing with one lowly demon. This is a power structure of demons. Mark 5, 9 says, Jesus asked him, what is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. So back in verse 33, it says, those who were tending the pigs ran off and went to the town and reported all of this, including what happened to the two demon-possessed men. Then the whole town came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave their region. So Jesus encounters two demon-possessed men. They are filled up with a legion of demons, powerful demons. Listen, it caused these men to harm themselves. They tormented them. They gave them supernatural power to where they could break chains off of themselves. Listen, these men were not to be messed with. In one moment with Jesus, these demons bowed down and said, Listen, don't torment us, Lord. It's not time. Have mercy on us. Just cast us into those pigs. So Jesus did. And guess what? Those pigs were, were tormented by this legion of demons and they cast themselves off the side of a cliff and drowned in a lake. And it says what happened? That celebration broke out and, and everybody got saved. No, that's not what happened. What happened is the people hurting the pigs went and told this miraculous work to these people. I mean, these two men who were tormented their whole lives by demons now are free. They're back in their senses, like they're, they're regular people again. Mark's account tells us that, 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 that one of the men told Jesus he wanted to follow him. And what did Jesus say? No, no, no. You need to go tell this, this story to the people of the whole Decapolis. Be my witness. Their lives were changed. They were insane. They were lost. They, they were afflicted. Listen, I saw this happen all the time at Teen Challenge. Men who were beyond help. Men that psychology and medicine and recovery had wrote off. These men are too far. Once an addict, always an addict. These men were, were suicidal and violent and liars and thieves. They, they walked away from their families. They stole their mamas. They broke into people's houses and they looked like the emaciated walking dead. And a word from Jesus. Jesus. And they became a regular men. They became fathers to their children. They became husbands to one wife. 
They became preachers and businessmen, but all of them became witnesses to the fact that Jesus is freedom. But in this case, the men herding the pigs ran into town and they told them about all the events. Listen, these men are now like normal men and these pigs were, were you know, in indwelled by these demons that audibly talked and they jumped off and they they drowned themselves in the lake and hearing this it says the people came out to see him but it says once they saw him they pleaded with him to leave the area some commentators insist the reason for this was because jesus had caused a herd of pigs which had monetary value to be dead now they're worthless And even if that's true, it's definitely not the main reason because the main reason is clear. The power of God is frightening to unrepentant people. People either fall down on their faces and repent when they see a powerful demonstration of God or they run away or they hope Jesus will go away. (laughs) Why wouldn't someone want to see a dead man raised? Why wouldn't someone want to see men who are afflicted by a legion of demons to be free? It's because the implications that come along with it. Listen, I've dealt with this many times in pastoral ministry. I dealt with this many times at Teen Challenge. People said, listen, addiction is destroying my friend or my husband or my family member or my son. They wanted a drug-free man to come out of our program, but, but a man that still loved the darkness they loved, the man that would still live like the, the lost man he was before, just free from the affliction that the demons of their life had put on them, the torture of the demons. Demons, the, the implications it had on their lives and the people around them. They didn't want sanctified Christians. They didn't want transformed witnesses and professors of Christ's gospel. What they wanted was drug-free men, mentally better men, men who didn't cause problems anymore. But what they realized is the gospel caused problems. The Jesus they brought home with them wasn't welcome. Now, I've seen some times where that person's witness changed their family, but I've also seen times where their family were like, listen, I'm glad the Jesus thing worked for you, but you need to get that out of here. I'm glad you're drug free now. I'm glad that you're not afflicted by your demons anymore. But don't shine the light over here. Don't judge us. Leave us alone. We want to manage our demons. We want to bargain with the devil. We want a better life in this life. But we don't want to be rid of the sin that we love. And listen, just like Lazarus to the Pharisees was something they wanted to kill again. They wanted to kill him because he was evidence that Jesus is Lord. Sometimes your resurrected, set free life is going to be evidence that, that, that causes people to reject you. You think you're better than me because you're a Christian? You're better than me because you don't live like we do anymore? Listen, people often want the miracle, but they want the Jesus of the miracle to go away. We live under the illusion that we are the masters of our own life. We don't want to be rid of the sin that we love. We want to be rid of the consequences of that sin. We are either slaves to sin or slaves to Christ. The illusion of personal autonomy is a myth. There is no middle place. There is no, hey, I'm not of the devil, I'm not of Christ. I'm my own man. Lo, if you're not of Christ, you are of the devil. And if you are in Christ, you are not of the kingdom of darkness. There is no middle ground. There's a broad road that leads to destruction. And there's a narrow path that leads to life. And sadly, Jesus says, few will find it. Demons tremble at the mention of his name. 
I want you to hear something because we talk about the name of Jesus sometimes in a mystical way, in a way like we think by chaining the name Jesus that, that demons flee from us. It's not necessarily the name that they're trembling at. It's the man behind the name. It's the God who holds the name. They tremble at the authority and the power and the lordship of the actual person. So when you represent Christ and you represent Jesus and you say, listen, I I like a son who, who wears his father's ring in the first century. You, you actually represent the one who sent you. I have the authority. I have the ring. I can make a seal. I can speak on his behalf. I can do his bidding and his business. The reason people tremble when you show up, if in fact you're a true spirit-filled Christian, is this. It's Jesus they're trembling at, not you. Because there's many people that, that use the name Jesus like it has mystical properties. New age people do this. False converts do this. But listen, even the demons know who he is, oftentimes better than they do. What people tremble at, what demons tremble at, the reason demons tremble at the mention of his name is because they fear the God behind the name. It's not saying the name of Jesus that has power and authority. It's the man behind the name. It's the God behind the name. It's the authority behind the name. It's the consequence. Listen, when you come in Jesus' name, you come with his authority and power. It's because you represent him. That's why Jesus, uh, through the apostle Paul, told Timothy, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. For God hasn't given you a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. Demons tremble at Jesus' name because Jesus is all powerful, because Jesus will judge all of creation, because Jesus is God's only begotten Son. This is why some who come in the name of Jesus have no power because they don't really have faith in the power and the authority of Jesus, which is often evidenced by their life. They just hope by using this name apart from faith that there's power. If they mystically chant it or if they really, really center in on it. I'm not saying that that there is no power to the name of Jesus. I, I know what it's like to be in the depths of addiction and cry out, Jesus! But I wasn't crying out to his name, hoping it had some mystical properties. If there was a God named Jesus, I wanted him to hear me. And in my desperation, he answered my call. Let me give you a little example, a little story. If I came to you and said, listen to me. You're, all, you're threatening me, but I'll tell you someone who can defeat you. Mike Tyson. In his prime, Mike Tyson. You have to to face Mike Tyson. The most important question would be, do I really know Mike Tyson? Do I have a relationship with Mike Tyson? Can I use his name this way? But if you came and said you were going to whoop me, and I said, I, I know Mike Tyson. I'm adopted into his family. I got him on speed dial. I'm going to call him right now. He's going to come here right now. It's an imperfect analogy, but the reason the name would have power because I actually have an association with him. My association is this is my dad. Mike's my dad. He's about to come over and whoop you. I don't want any problems with you because I don't want any problems with Mike Tyson. See, just chanting the name means nothing. It's about your relationship, your connection. And some people's relationship with God and their faith in God is so false. It's not rooted in the scripture. It's not rooted in reality. Some people's relationship with God is so casual that there is nothing that trembles when you you invoke the name of Jesus because it's by faith we're being saved. Listen, through grace, by faith in Christ, he's the one who is all powerful. Listen, we don't become 
become super powered agents of God. The power that we have is a gift from God that's, that's in us through the spirit of God. And all this because we are part of God through Christ. Oh, you of little faith. We don't have faith in something. We have faith in someone. And if you're connected to that person who is God and fully man, if you are connected into the vine that is life, when you call on Jesus' name, demons tremble. When you pray, they understand that you're praying to a God that you know who lives inside of you, whose power dwells in you. Many people willed the name of Jesus without truly knowing him, without truly fearing him, without truly trusting him, without bowing down before him. Listen, if our faith at least isn't even on the same level of the demons who tremble before him, the demons that Jesus was casting out, where is our, our true faith? How can we say if we don't even have the faith that they do? They knew that whatever Jesus said would happen. That's why the Bible says that we can come to the throne of grace boldly because we believe by faith that we are co-heirs with Christ. By adoption, we are sons and daughters of God the Father. That through the marriage of Christ, we are his bride. Oh, and a man who loves his bride is jealous for her. Listen, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a relaxed, peaceful man. You would have to work hard to get me into a fight. I would walk away. You'd call me all sorts of names. But if you come at my wife, you try to hurt my wife, you're going to see a side of me you don't ever want to see. Because I love my bride. How much more does Christ love his bride? Are you the bride of Christ? Philippians chapter 2 verse 9 through 11 says, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him a name above every other name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You can bow in reverence and honor in this life, or you can bow in shame and disgrace in the life to come, but make no mistake, these demons know every knee will bow. That demon bowed in real time. Have mercy on me. Don't, don't torment me before my appointed time. For us, we are children of God. We are connected to the name, but not just the name, the power behind the name, the person behind the name, the God behind the name. Demons tremble at his name. Do you? Lord, we thank you. God, we thank you that you are patient and kind with us. Lord, that we are fickle, God. We are prone to wander, God. We are, we are weak, broken humans, God. We are oppressed and depressed and possessed and by all these things in this world, God. Lord, and for those of us who reach out our hand to you, God, you give us freedom and life. Lord, I understand that sometimes, Lord, our overcoming happens in stages. It happens through sanctification as you're conforming us and refining us and making us like you. But God, I trust, Lord, that he who began a good work in me, and if anyone under the sound of my voice is in Christ, that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Lord, you have power over the demonic. You have power over addiction. You have power over pornography. You have power over sexual confusion. You have power over every knowledge and every stronghold that would exalt itself above the knowledge of you. God, you are king and you are God. Lord, I pray that would be true in many people's lives who hear this message today, God, that their faith would be strong, not because they're strong, but because you are God. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.